So uh, I'm really glad that uh, you are all here today, this morning. Uh, what we're going to talk about is packet fence. Uh, we've been working, I've been working there for two years, and uh, it's the first time we unveil, we talk about packet fence at uh, such large uh, event. We've mostly um, done stuff uh, locally in Montreal, so uh, I'm really glad to be able to talk to you about it, and uh, I hope I, I'll share my excitement. So uh, what we'll see today is what's network access control, really bl briefly. We'll talk about uh, the, the secret sauce, so how we do stuff and how it works. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about why open source has been uh, very helpful for us. Uh, the good and bad of the two years as a lead developer and some lessons learned and some ranting. And then the future of packet fans, so a bullet list of stuff we want to look at in the future. And uh, some community uh, begging for help and stuff. So uh, who am I? I'm uh, Olivier Bilodeau, working as a system architect for Inverse since uh, 2001, lead developer of Packet Fence. I'm also teaching information security at two undergraduate students in Montreal. Uh, I'm really into open source. Uh, I'm also a new father. I brought my baby here at DEF CON for the first, uh, she's seven months old, so it's been quite something, the airport and all that. Uh, I'm also enjoying CTFs a lot, so uh, we're uh, with the uh, Amish security team uh, doing CTF, and also the CISSP groupies, and we did the DEF CON qualification two years in a row with uh, mitigated uh, success. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, developing Tom Droid, which is an Android application too, and so uh, if you want to be interested in what I do and follow me, uh, here are the social stuff links. Uh, this talk will implement you drink, me drink protocol. So if I say something stupid, you can interrupt me and uh, force me to have a sip of a good beer. Uh, the beer I chosen was, I need to, to talk about it, uh, was uh, IPA, California IPA. It's really good. So I hope I'll make some mistakes. And there'll be some, uh, some beers. I only have these left. But for the debriefing, so people that come to the debriefing after the talk and have good questions, you'll have a beer. All right, so network access control. Uh, this is like you guys, this is the elevator pitch. Let's not focus on that. You guys are smart and you know what, like, what most of it means, so we'll go fast. Authentication. Basically, uh, authentication is map a username to IP, IP addresses or MAC addresses. So the, 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 the firewall doesn't discriminate between you know, uh, users and IP addresses, where NAC, it's the core focus is to be able to know this device is owned by this person, and it's really the, the, the binding of the two that is important for NAC. Uh, there's admission. Admission is allow, partially allow or deny users, and there's control. So uh, control here is uh, to watch for unauthorized stuff including outdated antivirus, uh, patch level, uh, someone scanning corporate servers, spreading malware, etc. So network access control uh, has the goal to do all of that. Um, there's the usual sales pitch stuff that you see, which involves a loop between detecting a device, isolating a device, notificating administrators about the, the states of these devices, and uh, remediation, which is a, a key point that we'll talk about uh, several times which is uh, how to, to help the user to remediate problems, including updating his uh, systems and stuff. Uh, so basically, it's know who is using your network and making sure they behave. And we're not talking who uh, an IP address. We're talking who a uh, username. So it's really important. An authenticated username. So that's. With time, what NAC has become, well, remediation of users, as I just mentioned, guest management, so a lot of people want to handle guests, put them on the internet only, no access to the internal servers, so it started to do that. Asset and inventory management, so um, it's there, it saw the devices, and so it categorized them for you, and you, you see it. And also, uh, it simplifies the access layer configuration. So. Uh, the more technical people come to packet fence because they are tired of doing per port configuration manually switching VLANs to uh, on ports. And so uh, with a, a NAC, the VLAN management is all done uh, in, the, in the server and more transparently, and it simplifies the, the access layer configuration. Uh, so the secret sauce. The technology, mostly Perl, some PHP. We're uh, do, uh, leveraging open source. Uh, the, the asterisk means that I'll be talking about it in the future. 
I did, did that a couple places, so this is the concept. And it's designed with high availability in mind, so everything we do, we always think about, uh, we use active passive clusters, and so uh, it's really a core focus because network access control, if it's down, no one accesses the network, which is really bad. So uh, it's from the ground up thinking in uh, clustering in mind. Uh, key design decision that we've made with Packet Fence, we're out of band, so this is the, uh, by opposition to being in line, which means that it's really the infrastructure that takes a decision. We're not in the flow to the, 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 the packet flow out to the network. So if the server fails, it most likely fail in a, in a, a sane state. Uh, so it's really by opposition to inline where uh, you see that there's a firewall doing the decisions and uh, the, pa the packet grow goes through the NAC device. So we're out of band, so no packet is going through the server. We're doing edge enforcement, so this means that the decision for access are done the closest possible to the, the, the endpoint, the, the, the client computer. So there's no, uh, it minimizes the attack surface by a lot. A client who, uh, who has not been a allowed in the network cannot scan servers and do anything. He's like, the switch decided that it couldn't get access, so really the edge uh, kicked him out, if you want. Uh, we use no agent, so this is a lot of the proprietary NAC are using an agent-based uh, system, and so we decided that it was error-prone and uh, buggy, and in a world where there are several devices co coming out all the time, we cannot cope with the developing agents for all of these, so we decided let's, let's not do that and focus on a web-based captive portal instead. And so that's what we do. Uh, listen to everything is also a big uh, thing that we wanted to do, is we uh, see everything that's out there. So we sniff the ARP, we sniff the MAC address when there are security violations done by the switches. Uh, when we see IPs, DHCP, we, we gather all that information all the time. If a user hit the captive portal, we record the user agent, so we're really about uh, identifying everything that's on your network. And a lot of people are amazed when they first uh, plug packet fence. Even if it's not doing enforcement, they will see a lot of devices that they weren't uh, aware about. Uh, so out of band, how we do the out of band stuff is uh, we rely on uh, SNMP traps. This was the, the, the first technique that we developed in 2007, uh, which was the first step that uh, we forked out of the, 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 the original packet fence project, which, were, which was based only on the HTTP. So the SNMP traps, we have uh, several implementation. One is for link up, link down events. One is for magnification event with our, uh, to my knowledge, a Cisco specific uh, trap. And then there's port security, which was at first Cisco specific, but then got picked up by, by a lot of vendors. Uh, the port security, the advantage of port security is that you get the MAC address in the, tr the SNMP trap that uh, gets sent to packet fence, which means we don't need to go and uh, uh, spoil a thread going to the, the, the port and waiting to see the MAC address show up on the port, so it's, it's really more performant. You have a comment? If uh, typos count, you have notification, not notification. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let's do it. That's good. Okay, so <laughs> then uh, we got radius-based technique that emerged, uh, which is um, 802.1x or MAC authentication. We will talk about these in a sec. So we first implemented wireless MAC authentication because the customer demand was for uh, wireless to manage the wireless and the wired side with the same software, same solution, which has been great for us. Then we implemented wireless 802.1x, which is uh, what most people know as WPA uh, uh, Enterprise. Uh, and then we uh, implemented uh, uh, lately the wired MAC authentication and 802.1x uh, pieces. So let's go into a little bit more detail. Uh, the, the SNMP trap enforcement works by event on the um, hardware that generates traps. We react to the trap. And then we use SNMP uh, client uh, to, um, to connect to the, to the switch and then perform uh, port authorization, so MAC address authorization on the port, and change VLAN if it's what is required to do the proper enforcement. 
So it's, uh, it's an asynchronous process, if you want. Uh, and uh, for most of the vendors, it works really well. Uh, for some of them, we need to rely on Telnet or SSH because their SNMP interface is not good, uh, which we don't really like. <laughs> um, yeah. So one of the advantage of the, the authorization and the edge enforcement by SNMP traps is that the, because of the asynchronous na nature of the, the authentication is if, let's say, the system would fail, the system would fail in the last state that was uh, established. So uh, the uh, port security trap is sent to packet fence. Packet fence saw the trap, saw the MAC address, decided that it should have been in the VLAN 100. It will go and put the user in the VLAN 100. Then there will be no security notification that will be done by the switch because we authorize the MAC address on the port. So as long as not uh, another device which has another MAC address which will generate a security violation and then the, other, the cycle again, then as long as you don't have new security events, the system will stay in the good state no matter if the packet fence server is up or not, running or not. So it's, it's really a great uh, advantage for this uh, technique. Now digging into uh, the RADIUS-based approach, let's uh, have a few reminders about the protocols related to that. RADIUS is a key value-based protocol for AAA. AAA stands for um, authentication. Uh, oh man, how come I for Authorization, thank you. I guess I'll drink again. Authorization and then audit. So uh, it's a very uh, infrastructure type. I, uh, accounting or audit, all right. I want to argue, you guys are right, smarter than me. Twice. Okay, so it's an infrastructure protocol. There's nothing uh, like the switch speaks with the server and there's nothing that the client needs to implement. Let's not get into 802.1x uh, so far. So if you look only at this piece, it's really infrastructure based. Now, let's build on top of RADIUS and, and uh, see 802.1x then. Um, what is it? It is extensible authentication protocol over RADIUS. So uh, EEP and all that nasty PEEP, MS chap V2, and then encapsulation over encapsulation and stuff. So it's, it's uh, adding a lot of uh, new components to the, the, the pure RADIUS that uh, we just saw. So the actor in 802.1x are the supplicant the authenticator and the authentication server. Uh, I've never saw any authentication server besides uh, uh, RADIUS, but I'm pretty sure you can do it with Diameter. So uh, it's uh, options. The supplicant is actually the client, and you need something on the operating system to support 802.1x, so it's not as transparent as MAC authentication is. Uh, it, and the client-side software has been integrated in Windows, in Linux, in OS X uh, for a couple of versions now, so it's pretty uh, stable. But we'll see uh, problems with that uh, later. And authentication, most people know it, uh, authenticator, sorry, most people know it as the NAS, so the network access server. Uh, all right. Uh, the protocol even allows you to send stuff to the client. So this is how WPA Enterprise is set up, is that it, it, as part as the uh, authorization and authentication, it will send the, the, the keys in this encrypted tunnel. This is all, if you see the little diagram, this is all pre-DHCP, so pre-IP, and this is what it, why it's called port access control, uh, port-based network access control. Uh, MAC authentication is su simply uh, taking a step back for 802.1x. When the device doesn't support it, we do a simple radius auth authentication uh, authorization with the MAC as the username of the, uh, in the radius system. So it's really similar to the 802.1x, but there's no strong authentication. There's no end-to-end -end with the client. Uh, so it's, it's more of a, the infrastructure is taking care of all the, the boilerplate, if you want. Um, also, in the, the new, quote unquote, uh, techniques related to RADIUS is a RADIUS COA, which I'll talk about a bit later, uh, which means change of authorization, which is RFC 3560, 60, anyway, you guys saw it. Uh, <laughs> which is, so the COA answers the problem of doing, uh, because RADIUS is initiated by the, 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 the switch and the client, the COA takes care of 
the server says to the switch, please rethink the security posture of this device. And so it's, it's kind of adding a new uh, asynchronous nature to the usually really synchronous nature of radius. Never bring your friends to your talk. <laughs> All right. So uh, what do we do for the, the enforcement then? We accept, access, access, accept, sorry, uh, most requests. And then uh, based on that acceptance, we return the proper VLAN attribute uh, on clients. When someone is not known to the system or is not authenticated, we return a registration VLAN, so a VLAN where we uh, present a captive portal. Or if the user in, should be in isolation state, uh, we, we return the isolation VLAN. And so that's how the, the, the magic does. So we do access, accept most requests. Otherwise, the user will not have a, a network access, which is kind of defeats the purpose. Um, we use free radius to do the radius and dot one X uh, pieces, and it's great. Complicated to configure, but it's great. It works well. Now, what we added is a Perl uh, module to the FreeRadius. FreeRadius has this RLM Perl facility, which uh, allows us to use uh, Perl code directly into the FreeRadius. It's very performant, and we, with that, we do a SOAP request to the uh, PacketFence uh, uh, daemon, if you want, to the Apache uh, of PacketFence. And, and the decision is taken server-side, so uh, this uh, allows for a nice architecture that I'll talk about later. Now, moving on to the captive portal. Um, OK, uh, various authentication mechanisms. So we support LDAP, AD, Radius, Kerberos, and guests. We use the portal to do the authentication. If a user uh, did 802.1x, then the authentication is already went to the, the AD server. So we don't need to present the captive portal. So it's, uh, there's a lot of options there, actually, if you want to automatically register devices and stuff. Uh, what does the captive portal do after someone's uh, authenticated over HTTPS strongly is we redi redirect them to the internet. Uh, and we can also provide re remediation information, uh, which we'll see later. In order to reach the captive portal on the VLANs where we present the captive portal, we uh, provide the HTTP. And then uh, in the HTTP, we provide the DNS server and we do a DNS black hole. So any request will get the same answer, which is the packet fence server. It's really simple, cheap technique that we do. Uh, and then with the first hit on the browser, we use a mod rewrite to rewrite the URL. Uh, for example, google.com will be re rewritten to pf.initech.com slash captive portal, which allow us to have a valid certificate because we have a domain name there. So it's not like other solutions which are uh, doing reverse proxying, which then you have uh, SSL problems with that. So it's kind of, I'm kind of glad that we did that. Um, so how do we do our voice over IP now? Um, our old technique, because we're kind of changing this right now, is uh, we rely on CDP and the voice VLAN features of the switches, which uh, is actually easy to uh, attack if you want. So uh, now what we do, is we handle them as regular devices, and we try to automatically register them if the user wants that. But uh, so there's still the older technique, and CDP is so transparent that a lot of people prefer that, even if it's insecure. Uh, over radius, uh, we do MAC authentication, and then your phone doesn't really matter. Uh, what more matters more, more is your network device, so the switch in question. Uh, and with 802.1x, there are some vendor-specific attributes in Radius to control the behavior of the, of the, the VoIP uh, stuff. But uh, we've never saw a lot of uh, 802.1x cap capable uh, phones. So it's really a tricky business. And we're not, we're, we, we've done it over wireless and wired, but it's not, uh, I think we only got it uh, with Avaya so far. And there's no, not a lot of customer demand for it. And because there's not a lot of phone, who does uh, 802.1x, so it's getting there. Maybe I'll have another presentation on that. How do you handle devices downstream from the phone? The, the uh, PC behind the phone, uh, voice over IP? Yeah, this is exactly what I mean by voice over IP, is that if it's only a phone, then I don't really care. I'm, I am handling it like a normal device. But if it's, there's a, a PC behind, then 
there are problems with that, uh, especially regard because we provide the HTTP. You know, I'm, I'm seeing the time I'm flying, and I, I really want a question about it in, the, in the, the debriefing, and I'll give you all the details. It is tricky business. When it's over a uh, radius-based technique, it's easier and it works better than when it's over uh, SNMP-based techniques because of the, 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 the influence of changing the primary VLAN ID on the port and stuff like that. You really need to be careful and tag the proper voice VLAN and stuff. So yeah, I want to talk about this uh, later. So, uh, for, so for the voice over IP, a, a little note to pen testers, most want auto-registration of the phone. They don't, the phone doesn't have a browser. So you cannot, uh, you know, uh, uh, ask your user to go uh, on the phone and register it. So uh, either they they um, they have a list of all the MAC addresses and they automatically register them, or they they do it through several techniques, which is MAC vendor prefix. I saw that. I think the Treecom switches do that, which is really discutable, which is a really tricky or I think an insecure technique, if you want. Uh, others do it through CDP. Uh, we, uh, packet fans, do it a lot with uh, DHCP fingerprints, which are uh, something I talked about yesterday, uh, about the finger bank project, which is really rarely spoofed so far. But as more people will gain awareness that we're doing DHCP fingerprints, I'm pretty sure it will get spoofed, and then people will get access to the, the, the LAM by spoofing a DHCP fingerprint of a phone. And um, also, uh, the, some fo the phones that are 802.1x capable are doing uh, MD5 authentication, which is a, a flawed uh, EAP technique for uh, 802.1x. So it's not, it's not great. And so uh, the note is here, spoof any of these techniques, and you'll get access to the voice VLAN. And then from that, scan and try to pivot, maybe if you can, on the media server. So pen testers, you should really look into the voice VLAN stuff. So uh, quarantine is the uh, captive port portal sorry, feature uh, where we present remediation information to the user. Uh, here's a screenshot of how it's done. Um, now, I made that up. It's not a real uh, t uh, technique that we have. It's written here, you have been detected using Windows 95. Please, please install a decent operating system. Download OpenBSD. <laughs> That will probably not work on a desktop computer, but I don't want to get a flame started. Uh, so the triggers we have for quarantine is up operating system based on our DHCP fingerprint, browser, Mac vendor, Nessus, uh, IDS, which is snort-based, uh, which I'm, talk I'm going to talk about in the, the next slides. And so the captive portal provides instruction. It's really helpful to reduce help desk pressure when you implement NAC, and so uh, we We've been uh, really enjoying doing uh, stuff with that, and it's the customer who come up with the greatest stuff to do with, uh, with the, the quarantines, and we really like that. Uh, so the policy checking and monitoring, how uh, the Nessus side is um, client-side scanning upon authentication, it's, I say, somewhat limited, because if you don't uh, provide uh, a domain, for example, domain credential on the Nessus scanner, then you can only see the surface exposed on, the, on the, the client. So you can prevent them from running a web server, for instance, but you cannot do more. But if you do provide domain uh, admin credentials, then you can you know, uh, hit on the device and then list the patches and stuff like that. It's not free. And also, more, the more tests you have, the, more, uh, the longer it will take to authenticate, uh, to authorize a device on the network. And uh, it's something that a lot of people, what, it takes two minutes to do an SS scan on the client? It's too long, so uh, let's forget about that. So it's been mixed uh, love-hate relationship with the, our Nessus implementation. Uh, then uh, the Snort piece is more, you, most of you guys know Snort, I'm pretty sure. And so uh, it's an intrusion detection system. Uh, you clone your traffic that is going to the internet, to the packet fence server. You run a local snort instance there, and uh, you enable the rules you're interested in, too. And uh, the devices violating the rules will be isolated. Uh, it, it works really, really great, and we've been doing a lot of BitTorrent blocking, Skype blocking, uh, malware uh, detection, preventing uh, users from uh, end mapping the servers and stuff like that, and it's, it's, it's great. And with the, the quarantine uh, captive portal, we've been, we are able to provide a couple of, uh, like, you can do 
BitTorrent, three times after that, you are completely locked out of the network. So each time we present you with a captive portal, but you have a button to re-enable your access to the network. So you can do stuff to annoy your users if you want, like allow them to re-enable their internet access a hundred times or a thousand times and see how, how long they will uh, you know, try again and try again and try again to do peer-to-peer -peer before they are uh, getting uh, tired and just calling help desk, what's going on? No, we don't do that, and uh, it's probably because we were never asked uh, this. Uh, come up, come up over for a beer. <laughs> so, I again, being open source, we're really and and having running a business on open source, we're really really tied to what's going on on the. Here we go. Oh. I'm sorry. So yeah, uh, we're always interested. And the syslog stuff, there are new uh, switches that can send syslog uh, events. And uh, I've never, I saw the features and I never looked into it. But it would be something really, really interesting. We, we, we do support that. We have a, a remote mode for Snort, which uh, we use our own daemon. We tail the, the, the alert, alert file. And then we uh, do uh, SOAP uh, requests. So then you avoid uh, crashing your whole uh, you know, packet fence because there is a gigabit of traffic per second to analyze for Snort. But Snort, with his uh, single-threaded approach, has been quite good because it cannot crush the rest of the system because it's only using one core, one thread. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's still interesting. And we have a, a really big, big uh, enterprise customer running Snort and packet fence on the same server. And it's, it's doing great. So uh, how do we support network access? I see that I, I will run out of time. I need to uh, move fa faster. Uh, so uh, adding a new uh, supported switch for the radius-based technique is really, really great. All we need to do is, because all the legwork is done by free radius, all we, we say is we support wired.1x. And if the, the NAS port that is sent by the, the switch is the same as the EF index, there's nothing else to do. Uh, and then we implement deauthentication, which is, again, very standardized. There's the PAE reauthenticate SNMP MIB that works in like 99% of the cases. And so for us, adding new radius-based supported device is really easy. SNMP is more challenging uh, because it's not uh, uh, standardized as, uh, as much, especially regarding port security. A lot of the, the hardware do it per switch port VLAN, and uh, some of them do it per switch port. And so because of that, there are different tricks that we need to do, especially with uh, voice over IP again. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a love-hate relationship. And it's one of the things that brings us uh, customers. And you know, uh, we, we work on supporting new hardware, and they pay us to do so. So it's, it, it's been good for the business. But uh, for your mental health, uh, it's not that great. It's like. There's nasty bugs in there. Uh, I, uh, we, I'm going to talk about it earlier, uh, later, a little later. But it's mostly read the switch documentation, try to configure it, figure out that there are mismatch between the documentation and how you do actually do configure it. And then you SNMP walk, and you try to find the, the, the sexy stuff you're looking for, the MAC addresses, port security information. And then you do your SNMP set. And then as, uh, when you got it working with SNMP set, then you uh, port it into your Perl code, and uh, then uh, you rinse, repeat, and uh, you have a switch working with SNMP. Are you working with all three versions of SNMP? Yes, uh, we are. But this is a net SNMP library, which encapsulates all of that. Uh, but uh, uh, we've got, I don't know if I don't want to name any names, but uh, there are implementation of SNMP v3, which are really, really buggy. And it's not our fault. It's the switch's fault. And so sometimes. You know, we face problems, and we need to pull in uh, other modules and stuff. And uh, it's a love-hate relationship with SNMP v3. I really prefer when a customer has a management VLAN, which is guaranteed to be isolated. And so I'm, I'm telling them, you know what? SNMP v2 is fine by me if you're, you're sure that no one can sniff on your management VLAN. But again, it's all arguable. 
so the packet fence then is the zero effort NAC, which is a VMware appliance which we have version for the desktop uh, suite and also the ASX, ESX uh, stuff. So it's pre-installed, pre-configured, and uh, people can really try packet fence quickly uh, with a VM instance. So just wanted to let, let that out. <laughs> He's glad. I'm glad that you're glad. Okay, so open source for the win. Uh, what has been great for uh, with, uh, doing open source for us is the vendor independence. A lot of the, the network access uh, uh, are competitors, if you want. Uh, they really clue in into the, the, the uh, a vendor, or they do not, and then do art poisoning or other inline techniques, which are, in my opinion, uh, less secure. And so, uh, because of being open source, we kind of, you know, poke at the firmware uh, and try to make it work. And when one wants a device implemented, uh, we work on it. And a lot of the, let's say, mostly universities, uh, they, they actually develop their own module and they send it to us. And then we support new hardware, and that's just been great. Uh, the Proprietary uh, pricing is questionable. Uh, there is per IP, per concurrent connection, uh, per AP uh, access point, per switch uh, license fees. So it's really kind of uh, odd. And, and for uh, a lot of people migrating over to packet fence, they tell me, like, we pay so much for our NAC solution, it just doesn't make any sense. And it's because they charge per IP. And people are using wireless, and every device that you have, like five of them on yourself, and you just cost them five licenses because they all wanted to hook on the network. And so sometimes they really like, uh, we need to move away from the proprietary stuff. Uh, also, because we can stay focused and we build on top of Apache, Bind, DHCP, uh, NetSNMP, FreeRadius, Snort, IP tables. Nessus, uh, 70 plus CPAN modules that we pull in when you install packet fans. So, like, we're really into reuse, I guess. Uh, we uh, use Linux and it's been uh, really great. So, this is an, also an, av an advantage because the stack is familiar. So, you guys all know the, the, the tools, and when you really need to tweak the things, you can do it yourself. And when you need to troubleshoot, it's not dark, arcane magic that you cannot understand or, can, or, or you need to call support for. It's stuff that you actually can see and that you can Google on, uh, on Google. So, <laughs> so it's great because, OK, I have this free radius problem. I Google it. And then, oh, everyone has a, a similar or a twist, a different problem. And you can help troubleshoot yourself by doing that, which is not something we can say of the proprietary offerings. And so it's been uh, also good. Security is not necessarily uh, solely based on security. On obscurity, sorry. So what I mean by that is that this is network access control. There are some things that we kind of lift the carpet and put the, the dust uh, under the carpet because we are doing questionable things because we want you know the customer to be able to deploy easily and you know uh, a NAC is better than no NAC, so we still need to have them. Con um, it all boils down to user friendliness versus security, and you guys all know about that. So uh, other solutions can be all about obscurity, but we, since it's open source, people can look at it and say, hey, you guys are doing like funky stuff over there, and maybe you should not do that. And so uh, it's an advantage because you can look at it, poke at it, and find problems. So what I've been learned uh, and what have been we doing bad and doing good for the last uh, two years, so let's go. Most snacks are easy to bypass. This is something I learned by, while working at Inverse uh, because of uh, network administration friendliness. So per port exceptions for printers, voice over IP, uplinks, you find them, you can leverage them. CDP is being enabled on access port, which is, in my opinion, a problem. Uh, real DNS is exposed. So if your NAC solution is based on offering the internet DNS, there are a lot of tools to be able to tunnel uh, TCP into uh, DNS. So you can uh, tunnel out. Uh, and because there is no authentication built in into layer 2 or layer 3, if you're not doing 802.1x, everything can be hacked or spoofed. So you can change your IP address. You can change your MAC address. Uh, you can change your, your DHCP client to be able to spoof the, the fingerprints I was talking about earlier. Uh, you can spoof your user agent. And 
user agents spoofing has been uh, known to get you out of uh, Cisco's, uh, I don't, Mac profiler. Anyway, they, they see if it's an iPod or iPhone or uh, iPad user agent, then they let you through because they don't have any agents for this uh, OS. And so because of that, again, it's because there's no authentication and, and you can uh, spoof this stuff uh, client side and there's the, the trust, which is fake, then is easy to bypass. And so again, coming to MAC address spoofing, printers don't have browsers, so they will, n they will uh, often be pre-registered pre into the NAC uh, devices. And so uh, printer is so easy to find the MAC address on a printer. You go there, do your physical pen test, you pop the, the printer on the side, you look at the MAC address, you put it on your Backtrack 5 uh, client, and then boom, you're allowed in the printer VLAN and you can start scanning the, the, the print servers, which are Windows, which are not patched, et cetera. So another thing I learned is that you can bypass 802.1x, uh, but there's a talk uh, actually right after this, uh, which is focused only on that uh, two-hour talk on how to bypass NAC, uh, 802.1x, but let me uh, still tell you what's uh, the, the technique. So you put a hub between the victim and the switch. The goal is to prevent the port from going down. See so if there is no uh, link down, then the, 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 the stack is not reset because it's a port-based network access control and once the access has been granted, there is no uh, continuous m monitoring of what you have been doing with the access. So you wait for the victim to successfully uh, uh, authenticate because you put a hub in between. You spoof your MAC address with the victim's MAC and then uh, you plug into the hub and bam, you bypassed 802.1x completely. This was a, I, di I discovered this by a, kind of a mistake when I was working on uh, uh, 802.1x capable phones and uh, I kind of couldn't believe it and I googled it and then I found on Wikipedia and on uh, Microsoft there, are, there is an article from 2005 talking about this problem. But now the bad thing is that they're doing appliances like the Pony Express which is doing 802.1x uh, bypass. So it's really interesting to see that it's gaining traction after all that time. So the attack scenario is you have two things you can do. You keep the legitimate client connected, which is bad because you'll have duplicated MAC addresses on the same segment, but which is good because the client can re-authenticate if the switch asks to. Uh, or you replace the leg legitimate client, which is bad because you won't pass a re-authentication request because you're not able to provide a strong uh, authentication. Um, but what is good about it is that you will not have network problems because there are no uh, duplicated MAC on the segment. Uh, it works, and uh, see the a bridge too far talk by Skip, which is after this talk in uh, track one. And uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that because he's doing uh, bridging, he'll be able to uh, to uh, cir circumvent the, the the problem I'm I'm uh, mentioning here, the attack scenario, because he'll be able to firewall in between, let the EAP over LAN go through the client, but still intercept the the the, the good stuff that he's want to do in the the man in the middle. Uh, getting into 802.1x is tricky business. Uh, I'll just keep that. It's, it's buggy. Uh, the support varies and stuff. Um, another thing, the 802.1x wired on Mac OS X is buggy. I haven't tried to reproduce it on, uh, in Lion, but uh, it's, it's definitely buggy. We opened a ticket uh, with Apple and they, they said uh, send us a ton of logging and we did and uh, we never hear, hear back from them. But we'll revalidate again on uh, 10.7. But still, the, the, the point is, it's just that we're always finding problems in every, you know, pieces where we need to interact with, and it's, it's not uh, an easy game to be a network access control software. Uh, what I learned also is uh, network vendor fragmentation. So VLAN assignment through SNMP is done in like, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, 25 different ways they are port lists, they are really uh, straight one assignment. Uh, so a lot of different weird stuff that you can see. Port security is named differently, implemented differently, SNMP access is inconsistent. Uh, if you go into the radius-based enforcement, then uh, wireless, wired MAC authentication has many, many names. I think I, I have a few here. Where is it? So uh, Cisco calls it MAC authentication bypass or MAB. Uh, HP calls it Mac-based authentication. Nortel calls it NEEP, which is no, no EEP. Uh, Extreme Networks calls it NetLogin. Uh, Juniper calls it Mac Radius. 
So uh, there's a lot of different stuff going on uh, in that space, and it's, it's not making the, the anything easy for us. Uh, there are gray areas in that one x where you don't really have guarantees about what will go uh, with the DHCP on the client, and thus the problems probably with the Mac OS X. Uh, the radius change of authorization is not supported everywhere, uh, which makes it a little bit harder too. So uh, really hard, but the situation on the wireless side is better. I guess they learned from the, the wired side of things, and they avoided a lot of mistakes. So MAC authentication and 802.1x wireless is really great, and uh, we've been implementing really more easily uh, the, the, the APs and the controller. Usually, the, I don't know, uh, like one day to figure out how it works and make it work, and another day to document uh, the, for our network administration guide and uh, make uh, additional tests to make sure that uh, it will scale and everything. So two days, and we support a new uh, controller brand, so which is pretty good. Uh, learn network vendors firmware quality. So there are so many regressions, and we like get client. They update an iOS. Did I say iOS? They upgrade a, a switch uh, firmware, and then boom, something that used to work before stops working now. And so it's really, really uh, painful. Uh, weird coincidences. Uh, I've saw the same exact bug implemented in like four different brands, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, it's the same bug, and it's an obscure bug. And, and so you see that there is uh, probably a lot of, you know, uh, of uh, people buying code out of other vendors and stuff, and a lot of reuse of the same code, which uh, unfortunately, I guess, is handled very differently because the, the bugs are fixed in one vendor but not the other one, but it's obviously the same bug. Um, also, something that happened with us is, oh, I think there's a bug in there, and the vendor says, oh, right, it doesn't work using the common line interface, but it does work in the web GUI. But who manages hundreds of devices using a web GUI? Aside from controllers, which do a pretty good job, but for switches, come on, this is really odd. And scale issues, I just wanted to, uh, to hint on an issue I faced where uh, the people were handling in the SNMP, they were handling the MAC addresses saw on the layer two in the same table as the MAC addresses secured on ports. So when you want to uh, list the secure MAC address on the switch, if the layer two network is really uh, large, then you start to SNMP walk tens of thousands of devices, and it makes the whole thing completely slower. So we often face problems like that, and that we just don't know what to do with that. And then we rant on the network uh, vendor, and they say, hey, come on, it's not us. Uh, it's been working fine for most people. But then you ask them, do you have a uh, NAC implemented with one of the NAC providers? And they say, uh, no, what's NAC? So it's a problem. I know some people aren't going to agree with this, but all vendors hold tight on their issue trackers. Uh, mo uh, I'm talking network vendors again. Most, they hold tight on their firmware, so we have... You the customer pays us to implement NAC on their switch, and we are having a hard time downloading their firmware. This is not normal. Like, we need to escalate and, and send a lot of email. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, some of them even hold tight on their documentation. So we got a physical switch that they sent us, but we are having a hard time downloading a PDF to configure the said switch. It's really, really a problem, and can it just stop? You know. Opening your documentation, opening your firmware has proven to be a good thing for like, let's compare Visual Basic with PHP in the 95 days. Uh, PHP, all documentation was open, so it got picked up by search engines and people who had problems had really, really easy way to find solution. But with the network uh, control stuff, the network vendors, you, you Google and you get almost never good answers and uh, you, you get a lot of uh, open-ended questions that are not answered. So please, come on, they should get wikis and they should do it the open source way. It will make everyone's life easier. And right now I think it's, it's more uh, penalizing their, their customer who paid for their hardware the way they are uh, working right now. So I'm a little distressed by that. Okay. Um, Okay, again, learn, uh, nobody does infrastructure authentication, which is a big security problem. Let's skip to that. Okay. The bad thing we do with PacketFence, 
first installation step, disable SC Linux. Yeah, that's right. We suck at SC Linux. We tried. We just couldn't figure it out. If someone wanted help, it would be really appreciated. Uh, we have two short release cycle for a core piece of infrastructure. We like released 11 uh, releases in the last uh, year or so maybe. And so it's uh, really fast for uh, most people. Uh, we don't have uh, Nmap integration. I really, I, I saw Fyodor speak at DEF CON last year and I really am into Nmap, but we still couldn't get help or uh, time or you know, customer mind share to implement Nmap. So we've done, not done it and I think it's bad. Uh, external code contribution are scarce. We're having a problem creating a good community, probably because it's not sexy doing network access control. Uh, it's really, you know, enterprise infrastructure stuff, which is really, really not attracting a lot of uh, developers. Uh, and we're pretty much CentOS uh, rail uh, for now, but we're, we want to fix that. So what we've done that is good, um, we improved a lot on the last two years, the development process and the infrastructure. Fully automated smoke tests, we're packaging every night uh, the, the software builds. There are new packages out and you can uh, hook on a YUM repository on the latest software. Uh, our, our branches are stable, so we have a stable branch. Everything is public. There is no like big code dumps like Android, where all, every commit is public and on the internet. So it's, it's really a true open source project. All uh, GPL, by the way, I don't think I, I have this anywhere in my slide. So it's all GPL uh, based uh, license, uh, the code. Is usability plus plus, we really work hard on simplifying the installation, the upgrades. If you've tried packet fans like uh, two years ago, give it another try because it really, really changed a lot. Uh, we got enterprise uh, new feature so you can have users write for people using the web admin. This way your help desk cannot screw up the whole system. Uh, we support routed environments out of the box. Uh, so this, we inject automatically static routes and do the, the DHCP config and all that stuff. So we've been uh, uh, deploying a lot in campus-based uh, environment where you, know, you need to route uh, between the buildings uh, and it works really, re uh, really well and it was an appreciated feature. 64-bit um, support, we now have a fancy guest uh, workflow support. We've been working on that branch for a year and now we're uh, about to merge it with, with the upcoming uh, 3.0 release we're going to do. Uh, we improved performance uh, in several occasions. Let's skip that. Technology, uh, we um, support web services to manage hardware. We've been uh, doing also web services for the radius uh, access uh, control. So people could technically decouple the free radius. Let's say you keep your free radius on your cam uh, per campus and then you do a SOAP uh, request, so a web services request to the packet fence server. So you could have a technically a, a distributed architecture, like three layer architecture, but based on radius. Uh, we also did packet fence in the cloud on EC2. Uh, the only thing you need locally is an open VPN and everything is tunneled. So this was more as a fun uh, hacking project that we did. Uh, no one really wants to pay for that, we realized. Uh, <laughs> because it's too scary, you know, to have network access in the cloud. Uh, making inline and out of band work at the same time on the same server, this is really new. Uh, and we're, we're releasing this with 3.0. So we'll be able to support uh, old ancient hardware at the same time as uh, VLAN isolation and strong, uh, good technique. Uh, this is really, uh, I think, some interesting um, feature. How long do I have left? Two minutes? Okay, I need to, to bypass that, I'm sorry. So we did a proxy bypass, client-side proxy bypass, really interesting. Read the slides if you want to see what I mean. Uh, JavaScript network access detection, we've worked on that too, which uh, is kind of a hack because I'm trying to avoid uh, uh, the cross-domain origin policy uh, stuff. And uh, it's, it's kind of neat, that's why I included it here, but let's skip that. So short term, we're going to do inline mode uh, to support easier uh, legacy network hardware, now in beta, so it's uh, public uh, already. We want to do radius accounting, bandwidth monitoring with the proper alarms for it, so we could be more a hotel style network access control, I guess. We're looking into NAP and statement of health, client time checking, radius change of authorization, which we haven't do yet, ACL and QoS assignment with radius. Uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues have been working on that. We're now 
kind of unsure how we will present the interface to the user, but we've got the, the basic technology and technique working. It's just more of how we will, uh, we will present the feature to the user. We would like to support VPN, so then we will be uh, really covering every access control techniques that we know about. Uh, Debian Ubuntu support, of course. Longer term, we, we uh, kind of hate uh, the active-passive approach for uh, doing high availability. We would prefer a simpler active-active clustering approach, so we'll be, we're working on that. Nmap open VAS integration and making this stuff click next, 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 easy to install. We're making progress uh, with this, with the 3.0 beta. Uh, we'll be able to, uh, for the PacketFence Zen solution, it will be DHCP-based NAC. You plug in uh, in the uh, a trunk port and it will mostly work for most people. So we're really making progress uh, with that and trying to make it easier all the time. Uh, research topic, so if people are really interested into uh, more advanced stuff, we want to implement IFMAP. Uh, we're looking at uh, doing client-side agent, but we would like a multi-platform, like Python-based maybe approach and stuff. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. We beg for help. We want everyone to use PacketFence if they can. Uh, conclusion, I hope I demystified NAC for you guys. And you should give PacketFence a try if you manage the network, because I think you'll see value quite uh, quickly. Thank you very much. See you in the briefing room. <laughs>